My name is John LaBelle, and this is an introductory lecture for my section in first year history of architecture. We're looking at the notion of modern architecture and traditional architecture. Okay, it's real simple. All architecture before modern architecture was built on the symbolic traditions of its culture and references to previous styles, often within their culture, so it'd be continuation of them. So a Gothic cathedral is symbolic of uh, medieval Christian Europe, and then all Gothic cathedrals are within that style and refer to other Gothic cathedrals. Modern architecture is based on we're here now. We have two heavy duty tools, reason and science. Science seen very broadly. Let's base our architecture on reason and science. What do we need? What are human beings like, studied psychologically? How do you make a building stand up? Doing calculations of steel beams. So, reason and science. So, to make the point, what are we looking at? Chess pieces. So, this is not modern architecture. This is the Metropolitan Museum in New York. We're going to go there in the next couple of weeks because you're going to have to bring to class a drawing of the Temple of Dendur. We have an Egyptian temple right here in New York. So we see these elements here, these arches, these columns. Anybody know what kind of columns these are? Pardon? Yeah, the Corinthian. So we're going to go into that, Doric, Ionic, and Corinthian columns, and we'll see the differences among them. But this is working within a Roman vocabulary rooted in Greece and expanded upon by the Renaissance and Baroque. And we'll talk all about that later in the course. And we come in here and these are arches inspired by Rome, domes inspired by Rome. I think these might be Ionic columns. They have little curlicues on it. We can barely see them. And here we are in uh, the uh, 19th century European gallery at the Met. And again, we have these historical moldings, historic Greek, Greek and Roman columns. This is the Baths of Caracalla. It's all torn down. It's just ruins left. But this is uh, projections of what it would have looked like, a Roman bath, sort of like a big health club spa. And we see the vaults, arches, the Corinthian columns. So that's where Metropolitan Museum is getting it from. It's rooted in this historical architecture. And it's saying something. Metropolitan Museum is saying that we Americans in the 19th century are rooted in European culture. That's our identity. This is the Great Hall of the Baths of Caracalla. Again, um, reconstructed. And here's the most famous um, Beaux Arts building in Paris built around the time of that very house that we heard about today. So you had to have something at the ends of the boulevards. So you know the Paris Opera. Always known as Palais Garnier, because Charles Garnier was the architect. And again, we got these columns. We got these elements from, this is from the east front of the Louvre Museum, which in turn gets it from 
the Baroque, which gets it from the Renaissance, which gets it from Rome. So it's tied into um, history. This is another museum in New York. Which one is this? Right, now, MoMA has had a lot of editions, and they're in the middle of another one right now. But this is the original facade of the 1939 building. So it was originally in a townhouse. 1939, they got their own building. And it was by Goodwin and Stone, Edward Burrell Stone. And we see roof garden raised up on columns, free facade, long window, all this stuff from, we heard about from the Kirby's Eight today. So this is very modern, and certainly it's in the modern style, but it's based on not historical tradition, but light, functionality, circulation, modern economical materials, no reference to history. Come in, there's no historical, this is the lobby, no historical elements. Here we are in a gallery, plain, clean, white walls. Again, no columns, no molding, no trim. And the only stuff we've got, it's sort of like trim, are the light tracks, totally functional. So, I don't know exactly what terms you should use, but let's just say historical architecture, modern architecture. Now, we can distinguish these, of course, by dates, but let's see if I can get the internet to work here. But the distinction is also a matter of style, because the date we had for the Edward Durrell, uh, Goodwin and Stone Museum of Modern Art was 1939. But if we go to Google, images, and National Gallery, Washington, D.C. This is the building that Donald Cromley was showing us this morning. And here we have a Roman dome, a Roman use of a Greek portico. So this would be a traditional architecture. But it's 1941, two years after Museum of Modern Art. So these overlap for a while. So the difference is one of do we see ourselves as modern, rational, materialist, scientific creatures? Or do we see ourselves as rooted in a culture? And that's the philosophical implications of these two different architectures. So, this is a chess set, and these are called Stoughton pieces. So they were designed for Stoughton in the mid-1800s. And they're the chess set we're familiar with, with the uh, rook or castle, the knight or horse, the bishop, queen, king, and pawns in these shapes. And you buy most any chess set today, it'll, whether it's a cheap portable plastic one or an elegant one will usually be in these forms. And so these pieces are rooted in a historical past. There, a bishop is a Christian figure, a knight is representative of a knight in shining armor, castle is a medieval place of defense, kings and queens, medieval kings and queens, pawns are foot soldiers, in medieval warfare. What have we here? This is a chess set designed in 1924 at the Bauhaus. 
And just the way Museum of Modern Art said, we're, what about, how about we exist today? Not rooted in some irrelevant past. Now irrelevant is, I don't mean to say it's irrelevant, I mean they said at that time it was irrelevant. We can decide what we think about it. But suppose we made an architecture that was functional, made with contemporary materials that um, serves our needs and doesn't refer to a bunch of past irrelevant stuff. That's the idea here. But if you say, I'm not going to have a horse and a castle and a bishop's hat, what do you have? So what is the source of the designs of these pieces? Say louder. The moves they make. How they move, right. So the castle can go that way or that way. The horse moves in an L. The bishop moves diagonally. The, I'm not sure which is the king and which is the queen, but they can both move both back and forth and diagonally. Uh, the pawns move just straight, unless they're taking. So, it's a functional aesthetic. Now, what do we observe if you go to a game store and buy a chess set today? It doesn't look like that. <laughs> you spend half your time, going, which piece is that? <laughs> you know, so maybe you're a little more comfortable with that chess set. So what does that say about, you know, how people feel about modern architecture? Something to think about. Um, so, um, I'll call this historical revival architecture because it's reviving here Roman and earlier examples. So, in historical revival architecture, the aesthetic is applied to evoke a historical period. And both, this is a Beaux Arts building, we'll talk about that next year, but it's an important historical revival stuff. In New York, the Metropolitan Museum, the 42nd Street Library, Grand Central Station, um, the Washington Square Arch, Brooklyn Museum are all Beaux-Arts buildings um, named for the architects who built them, studied at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts in Paris, and they were all built between maybe 1880 and 1920, 1910. And so the 1941 museum is, that I showed you is like not typical. Nobody was doing that uh, other than that building at that time. In modernism, it's built on rationality and science. So first we observe nature. Think of Leonardo da Vinci uh, observing uh, um, anatomy. Uh, then we understand nature. Think of Newton's theory of gravity. Oh, we can sort of, every other, everybody attracts every other body with a force uh, proportional to the product of their masses and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. In other words, we can make a theory that's generally applicable. Then we go to control of nature. Hey, I can take this stuff and make a steam engine. I can use it. I mean, Newton was living about the same way that a Roman lived. If you were a Roman nobleman, you would have, you know, Newton's life was no different. He was getting around by horse-drawn coaches. He was not using a uh, Mercedes. Um, then, with a period called the Enlightenment, we start to extend this to human beings. We say, you know what? If we apply a scientific understanding to human individuals and human society, we could make a better world by arranging human relationships according to our scientific understanding of human beings. And there are two great documents we associate with that thinking. It's going to be hard to guess. 
Declaration of Independence of the Constitution of the United States. In other words, these are, the Constitution says, you know, we know that all people act badly when they get power. So what we're going to do is we're going to have three branches of government. If any one of them misbehaves, the other two will try to stop it. Separation of powers, which was a rational idea applied to trying to make a better form of governance. So sociology, psychology, political science are an attempt to scientifically understand and make better the human condition. And then Darwin says, uh, we can apply this understanding to realize that we are natural biological creatures. Marx says, hey, we can apply this to a, have a scientific socialism in which by applying these principles, we can make a better human society. Got it all wrong, it was a disaster, but that was the idea. And then Freud says, you know, we can apply this to psychology. We can, there are mechanisms working within the individual psyche, and we can understand those and fix them. So that's the underlying basis of modernism, working from rationality and science rather than history and tradition. So which leads to modern architecture. Modern architecture, the aesthetic derives from an honest expression of the space, structure, materials, and activities. So you got a lot of people, they gotta gather when they come in, they're gonna look at paintings, we need certain kind of light, uh, we need to circulate a certain way, we're using this material, you can make about a 24 foot span economically with steel, so that tells us where the columns go. Uh, so you apply rational, this rational thinking that was being applied to human society and the Enlightenment, we now apply it to architecture. To me, that's modern architecture. Nothing to do with tradition, but based on a rational analysis of where we are now. So I think I'm gonna leave it at that. And um, any questions about that? Terrific. Okay, enjoy the rest of the week and we'll start on assignments next week. And next week, bring me that piece of paper with uh, filled in with a picture. See you next week.